How's it going? All right. So congratulations. You have made it to unit six. It's all downhill from here. We're mostly there. Now, we're looking at striving for independence in India, Latin America, and Africa. And a lot of the events that we're going to be talking about are spaced out over 50 years and some even more than that. So that's why we're starting this now. Um, we're going to begin talking about events that take place after World War I. We'll talk about some that take place before World War I. We'll also discuss a series of events that take place after and because of World War II. But let's start with the Great Depression. In the 1920s, speculation on the U.S. stock market had increased dramatically. During World War I, the U.S. had become the world's leading source of investment capital. And then it all came crashing down, literally. Because on October 24th, 1929, the New York Stock Exchange collapsed, ruining both investors and the bankers who lent them money. Each government began to enact policies that protected their own economies, but just made the global situation that much worse. In the U.S., the collapse of the New York stock market caused a chain reaction in which consumers cut their purchases, companies laid off workers, and small farms failed. It didn't help that there was also a massive drought that would take place during the Great Depression. You've probably heard of this. It's called the Dust Bowl. It's also the inspiration for a very intense novel called The Grapes of Wrath. And this is one of the most famous pictures of the Depression Dust Bowl era. Anyway, in 1930, the U.S. tried to protect its industries by passing the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act. Other countries followed suit, and the world trade declined by 62% between 1929 and 1932. It's all about keeping people buying goods that are produced within the country. In the U.S., France, and Britain, governments began to take a larger economic role. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was in office from 1933 to 1945, implemented a new deal. In Britain and France, socialist parties took the lead in policy in the 1930s. And France and Britain were able to escape the worst of the Depression by forcing their colonies to purchase their products. Japan and Germany suffered much more, with German unemployment reaching twice that of Britain, and the heaviest burden in Japan falling on farmers and fishermen. In Germany and Japan, radical politicians devoted their economies to military buildup, hoping to acquire empires large enough to support self-sufficient economies. India and China were not dependent on foreign trade, and thus were little affected. Countries that depended on export of raw materials were devastated. In Latin America, the Depression led to the establishment of military dictatorships that we will be talking about that tried to solve economic problems by imposing authoritarian control over their economies. Lower food prices hit hardest to those areas where the economies were dependent on agriculture. Countries such as Brazil, in which the entire national economy was dependent on crop exports, was, was hit especially hard. The Great Depression had a tremendous impact on social and religious lives. Turkey was attempting to build its industry to make them less dependent on foreign manufactured goods. Southern Africa boomed during the 1930s. The increasing value of gold and the relatively cheaper copper deposits in northern Rhodesia and the Belgian Congo led to a mining boom that benefited European and South African mine owners. In the 1900s, the world's largest cities were all located in Europe. But by 1950, four of the largest 10 were from outside Europe. By 2000, only two of the world's 10 biggest cities were in Europe. The rise of huge urban centers in Asia can be traced to inventions like the rickshaw, which not only transformed transportation, but brought significant new economic opportunities within cities. Electricity spread fairly slowly and it remained quite expensive outside the West, especially in the first part of the 20th century. And to the extent that the foot-operated sewing machine remained enormously popular. Um, just to give you guys a side note. So in my office, I have my work area, my computers, uh, my screens, all my books, yada, yada, yada. And then across the room, I have my sewing machine with the pedal. It's electric. But in the hallway, I actually have one of these. It's a Singer sewing machine, and these are what they're talking about when they say uh, the foot-operated sewing machine. They are not the easiest thing to use. It's a lot of manpower. But it still works. 
Film, photography, and radio all spread rapidly. Photography was especially useful in spreading news stories and information, especially in places where large parts of the population were illiterate. And as you see, we've got photography. We also have the first films. Uh, if anybody can tell me what this is from, more power to you. Um, if you're in my class, we actually watch parts of this. This is a silent film called Nosferatu. It is one of the, actually, it is the original vampire movie. It is completely silent. Um, there's a few texts here and there that all of my students got a good hearty laugh at. A little cheesy, but guys, that's technology. And let me tell you, Nosferatu did not glitter like a diamond in the sun, nor does he have secret pain. In terms of identity, more standard, less subjective ways to identify oneself emerged. And these included passports and driver's license. Another innovation in the standardization of identity was the perfecting of fingerprinting in police work. Meanwhile, women in parts of the world saw rapid changes in the post-war years, especially in the realm of politics. After World War I, women gained the right to vote in the U.S. and Britain, among other places, and also became prominent in a variety of social reform movements. There was also a revolution in the sciences, both physics and social. The discovery of subatomic particles, quanta, as well as Einstein's theory of relativity, undermined many of the old certainties about nature that had already been shaken by Darwinism. The psychology of Sigmund Freud and the sociology of Emile Durkheim introduced notions of cultural relativism that were unnerving, as some of these scientific theories at the same time Basically, guys, these new ideas are scaring the crap out of people. With the rise of artists like Picasso, as well as the emergence of movements like the Dada, there was a new insistence that art should challenge the tradition of realism and even the primary of reason. So Picasso and Cubism, folks, but you also have Dali's painting. Um, the Dada movement was thus called the Dada because it was a pointless, silly name. And this movement is just about, hey, just go with life. Um, don't rush through it. You could kind of compare it to a certain philosophy in the classical era in China. Think about it. Let me know what you think it might be. It's Taoism. Anyway. New technology. Guys, no new technology fascinated people more than airplanes. From the early work of the Wright brothers through the use of planes on the battlefields of the First World War, or the Great War, and the advent of intercontinental travel, flight captivated the public imagination. Health and hygiene were also part of the cult of modern times. Advances in medicine, sewage treatment systems, indoor plumbing, thank you for that one, and the increased use of soap and home appliances contributed to the decline in infant mortality. Eh, mortality, and improvements in health and life expectancy. So some of these new appliances, washing machines, no more washing by hand, no more washboards. Uh, you actually have refrigerators. And the thing is, guys, af especially after World War II, we'll get into this later, after that war ends, you do have the rise of a stronger middle class where suddenly almost everyone can afford to buy a car. Almost everybody can afford to buy a refrigerator, a radio, and then later on a television. The period also saw the rise of organized athletics as public spectacles, including soccer or football, and then American football, as well as the newly created Olympic Games. And there is going to be a DBQ on this, guys. So the first Olympics actually start 1896 is when they're, they're brought back. And over time, as the Olympics expand, and it goes from just being a game to a public event, and then a global public event that brings all of these nations together with the exchange of ideas. The skyscraper and the automobile transform the urban environment. Skyscrapers were built with load-bearing steel frames, and that also allows people like Andrew Carnegie to rise up. Passenger elevators were built in American cities. You can thank Otis for the modern break. European cities restricted the height of buildings, but European architects led the way in designing simple, easily constructed, inexpensive, functional buildings in what will come to be known as the international style. 
Mass-produced automobiles replaced horses in the city streets, and that led to the construction of far-flung suburban areas like those of Los Angeles. On farms, gasoline-powered tractors began replacing horses in the 1920s. And now we're going to switch gears completely, and we're going to start talking about imperialism. We're going to start with India. Despite periodic famines due to drought, India's fertile land allowed the Indian population to increase from 250 million in 1900 to 389 million in 1941. Population growth brought environmental pressure, deforestation, and a declining amount of farm land per family. Indian society was divided into many classes, peasants, wealthy property owners, and urban craftspeople, traders, and workers. The people of India spoke many different languages. English became the common medium of communication of the Western-educated middle class in India. The majority of Indians practiced Hinduism. Muslims made up one quarter of the people of India, and they formed a majority in the Northwest and in Eastern Bengal. So just take a look. Notice the regions, British Empire, India by 1909. <clears throat> colonial, colonial India was ruled by a viceroy and administered by the Indian Civil Service. The few thousand members of the Civil Service manipulated the introduction of technology into India to protect the Indian people from the dangers of industrialization, prevent the development of radical politics, and maximize the benefits to Britain and to themselves. At the turn of the century, the majority of Indians accepted British rule. But the racism and discrimination of Europeans had inspired a group of Hindus to establish a political organization called the Indian National Congress in 1885. Muslims, who were fearful of Hindu dominance, founded the All India Muslim League in 1906, thus giving India not one, but two independence movements. And that's very important to remember down the road, especially when we get into India Indian independence, and the partition of Pakistan. The British resisted the idea that India could or should industrialize, but Pramantha Nath Bose of the Indian Geological Service and Jamse Tata, a Bombay textile magnate, established India's first steel mill in 1911. And... These two men would become very powerful symbols of Indian national pride. In 1918 and 1919, several incidents contributed to an increase in tensions between the British and the Indian people. These incidents included a too vague promise of self-government and the incident in which a British general ordered his troops to fire into a crowd of 10,000 unarmed demonstrators. Indians lost their patience with the gradual British reforms after this massacre. Gandhi and other Congress leaders were arrested in 1920. And that leads us to discussing Mahatma Gandhi and militant nonviolence. Mohandas Gandhi, or also called Mahatma Gandhi, was an English educated lawyer who practiced in South Africa before returning to India and joining the Indian National Congress during World War I. Gandhi's political ideas included nonviolence in the search for truth. Although Gandhi was a Western-educated lawyer, he dressed as an aesthetic Hindu holy man, and Indians began calling him Mahatma, which means great soul. He led a series of mass resistance movements made up of the common man. Gandhi dressed and lived simply. His affinity for the poor, the illiterate, and the outcast made him able to transform the cause of Indian independence from an elite movement to a mass movement with a quasi-religious aura to it. Although Gandhi was Western educated, he was able to connect to pretty much everybody he met, whether they were educated or whether they were not. And he was able to connect to people who were both European and Indian. Gandhi's brilliance as a political tactician and master public relation gestures was demonstrated in acts such as seen in 1932, when Gandhi launched a campaign of peaceful civil disobedience on the Salt March, an 80-mile walk to the sea to make salt, which was in violation of the government's salt monopoly, in his several fasts unto death and his repeated arrests and prison sentences. Nehru is another leader in the Congress that we're going to talk about. And Nehru and Gandhi 
publicly declared that the Indian National Congress was open to Indians regardless of religious background. The Muslim League did not like this. In the 1920s, the British slowly and reluctantly began to give Indians control of areas such as education, the economy, and public works. High tariff barriers were erected behind which Indian entrepreneurs were able to undertake a degree of industrialization. This helped to create a class of wealthy Indian business people who looked to Gandhi's successor, and that would be Nehru, and the Indian National Congress. Nehru was a leader, much like Gandhi, but Nehru was more active in the political movement, which is why his name will appear later. Gandhi's leading the mass movements and the protests, but Nehru's working more behind the scenes, more with, with the law to change the law. When World War II began, it divided the Indian people. Indians contributed heavily to the war effort, but the Indian National Congress opposed the war, and a minority of Indians actually joined the Japanese side. In 1940, the Muslim League's leader, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, demanded that the Muslims be given a country of their own to be named Pakistan. When World War II ended, Britain's new Labour Party government prepared for independence, but mutual animosity between the Indian National Congress and the Muslim League led to the partition of India into two states, India and Pakistan. Partition and independence were accompanied by violence between Muslims and Hindus, and by massive flows of refugees as Hindus left predominantly Muslim areas and Muslims left predominantly Hindu areas. The Himalayan state of Kashmir has remained a contested site, and even the location of armed conflict between these two nations since their independence. All right, we're going to stop there for today. Feel free to send me an email if you have any questions. Otherwise, have a great night, guys. Cheers.